when we have uh, we are taking your views and your comments we will also give an opportunity to the participants and stakeholders who are actually joining us online so that you can also get their views from the other end so at this juncture i want to welcome waweru karanja who will in turn invite uh, uh, david karyuki uh, we are here today as the director general has said for a friendly conversation if you will uh, we're not looking forward to heated debates uh, we want to have a discussion an all-inclusive discussion with all of you as stakeholders and uh, we're looking forward to hear uh, the different views <clears throat> mine is very simple really I think uh, the DG has covered most of the reasons why we're here today and mine is to really emphasize as has been said before is uh, we're really looking forward to contributions from all sectors. Uh, it's not, do not feel like this is reserved only for the oil marketers, only for the transporters, only for the people involved in the industry. Uh, we're very happy to hear that there's so many categories of people who are in attendance today. And mine is to really, really encourage discussions from all aspects in order to come uh, <clears throat> together to come up with a conclusive tariff. And I'd just like to also mention one thing. It's good that we consider the tariff has two major aspects. Uh, going back to Section 11H of the Energy Act 2019, it empowers the authority to set just and reasonable tariffs. And what is the meaning of a just and reasonable tariff? There's two sides to a tariff. One side, we have a mandate to protect Monanchi. We want to keep your pump prices as low as possible. And we can see what's going on in the economy. That's of utmost interest to us as a regulator. But at the same time, you need to understand that the products don't get to your house, to your local station for free. So the other hand of the transaction, the other hand of the tariff, is that we need to give the utilities, the infrastructure, Kenya Pipeline Company, so to speak, we need to give them an opportunity to invest capital in order to give you these products in a safe, efficient, and an economical way. So our goal today, ladies and gentlemen, in as much as we want low pump prices to the consumer, we also need to consider that there's a lot of investment, time, money, and human resources that go into bringing this infrastructure to get the products to you. So those are the two sides. And as we have these discussions today, as you listen to the Kenya Pipeline presentation, bear that in mind. We're not here to hike prices for the consumers. We're not here to put prices so low as to make the utility not able to fulfill their infrastructure objectives. And that's really my role, a very, very short uh, comment I wanted to make. So as we go on to the next chapter, uh, let's be understanding, let's uh, be aware, alive to the facts of what goes into the tariff. Uh, this is a tariff that's going to run for the next three years. It's going to affect not only the lives of the people in this room, but society, Kenyan society is large, at large. So let's take the time to listen uh, to the presenters and um, let's also as I said let's hear all the views from you we as a regulator do not come in today this is not our forum the forum belongs to you the stakeholders let Kenya pipeline talk to you respond to Kenya pipeline let's hear what you have to say so that when we as a regulator retreat to come up with the final numbers let us have heard from all of you so that um, we do not, we're not accused of not having listened to Monanchi. So we've had a long journey uh, all across the country, as is required of us. Uh, we are completing the exercise later on this week uh, in Mombasa. And uh, we've had a lot of views. We've had very active, uh, very active interactions with uh, other places. West of Kenya mostly we've covered. And now we're in Nairobi, and we're completing the exercise in Mombasa. And just to encourage you to please air your views so that when we retreat to come up with the final numbers, all have been heard. So with those very few remarks, I'd like now to hand over the next part of the program to our very uh, experienced moderator, uh, my colleague David Karyuki. Uh, he's our deputy director in charge of energy planning. So David, please come, uh, guide us through the rest of the program. Thank you very much, everyone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, indeed, I think uh, we now know exactly 
why we are here. We are here to listen to an application. And because it's an application, um, it is expected that that application will never be processed until you, who are going to be impacted on by the application, say something about it. That's the beauty of the constitution that we have today. Because some years back, and I happen to be fairly old, I was there in government in the 1990s. If you wanted to change anything, you just changed. And then you told people, I have changed it. And that was it. You can't do that anymore. So today, we tell you, this is what we want to do. And because we want to do it, we know it will cost us something. So can you allow us to actually do it because we think it will benefit you in this manner? So that application will have to be made. And uh, if you look at institutions today, they are now organized in a manner that we have a sector regulator, we have a policy maker, and we have the utilities. Those are the ones who develop the infrastructure. They are the ones who will deliver products in, in, in case uh, they are products or services to you. And therefore, every time they want an adjustment, they make that application to a regulator, and that regulator comes to you. Because it is, since this adjustment will impact on you, then it's upon the regulator to make sure that that impact is not unreasonable, and also that the utility is left in, in a position that it remains viable. For that reason, therefore, we, are, we have received an application from KPC to adjust transport and storage uh, costs and uh, handling costs. They are therefore going to tell us why do they think there is need for an adjustment? What is it that they are going to do and why is it necessary? Uh, and that is precisely what we are going to be listening to. You will also then have an opportunity to say whether you agree with it or, or that there are areas that you feel need to be modified. Um, we will have the KPC team uh, do that presentation to you, but we also have the regulator with us. So we have the director, Petroleum, Edward Kenywa. I think he introduced himself. We have Dr. John Mutua, who is in charge of economic regulation at EPRA. Uh, we also have Waweru Karanja, who just left, who is in charge of pricing. I am in charge of uh, energy planning. Uh, and therefore, those, and we have, of course, the Director General, who just talked to you. Uh, that means they can respond to issues that are of a regulatory nature. But we would want as much as possible to uh, uh, co confine ourselves to this application. And to receive this application, we have a KPC team. Uh, Desterius Nyandika, uh, I, I believe you are here, is uh, leading the KPC. Maybe you can come and introduce the KPC team that uh, will be making the presentation. We also have Elizabeth with us and their team. I think they are quite a team. So, Desterius, maybe you can come and introduce that team before we receive the application itself. And the way we are going to do it is um, we will ask KPC to uh, present the application in full. Then we will break briefly to have a cup of tea. After that break, we will come back and uh, then we can engage on the application that will have been made. So to do the application, may I ask uh, Desterius to come and introduce the team to do this and also to proceed with the application itself. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, and uh, good morning, all stakeholders. I think very briefly I'll introduce our team from Kenya Pipeline, the team that will be taking questions from you. We appreciate all of you for coming today for this open forum that has been convened by, by IPRA. I'll start by introducing the panelists. 
On uh, the left, we have uh, Lokoyan from Supply Logistics. We have the General Manager of Finance and uh, the General Manager of Finance, uh, Pius Mwendwa. Then we have Elizabeth Akinyi, who will be making the presentation. Then we have the Manager of Supply Logistics, Karanja. Do we have, I think the Marketing Manager was supposed to be here. Grace, she must be on the way. And then I'll take this opportunity on our behalf just to allow the general manager uh, strategy to give opening remarks on behalf of KBC and invite Elizabeth to make the presentation. Silva Pongo, kindly. You can. Good morning. I'm acquainted with some of you from the petroleum sector, um, some of you from the media houses, and it is a great pleasure and delight for KPC to be in front of you, um, members of the public, because this being um, almost, I think, the third cycle and fourth iteration of um, a tariff application that's been brought before you, we have learned a lot through this process. We have appreciated the value that you add as consumers, as stakeholders, as users, as contributors to um, the product, the services that we supply. And we are very much interested in what you will have to say in relation to what we put before you because it's been a process of learning and it has made this process now so much easier now that we have uh, um, understood all the players and all the roles that we play. I mean, that each of us um, play in the system. As the DG mentioned, we have come a long way. Um, per, um, the period prior to the regulation and the Energy Act, we used to set our own tariffs and it was felt then it was uncompetitive, it was unfair, it was what not, even though it, we felt that it covered the costs that we needed to, as has been mentioned, as a utility. And now being brought before you into a moderated process, it really just gives um, credibility and, and um, gives the consumers confidence that what it is that comes out of this process will really be fair and just, um, as has been articulated. So the <coughs> tariff application that will be presented to you um, is a process, uh, I mean, a, a culmination, an output of years long of work. Um, it is of prudent costs. It is of much negotiation and consideration by the regulator, as well as much um, concession on what we could do to improve on our efficiencies. And we anticipate that this process will be as friendly as possible because ultimately the aim here is that the pump price that you pay only. Um, takes into account what it is that the consumer has to pay out of these public resources. So <clears throat> that being said, I would then like to cede the ground to Elizabeth, who will take us through the numbers. And um, we will field all the questions you have. Please do not be afraid. Please do not hold back, because pretty much this is the opportunity you have um, to let it be known to yourselves and to your families that this, um, the government does take your opinions and considerations very seriously. Thank you. many speakers here, I don't know where to place the laptop. I need some assistance.
Thank you. Uh, as I've said, I hope those who are viewing us online can also, uh, joining us online can also view the presentation. As has been mentioned, uh, my name is Elizabeth Akenyi, and my task this morning is to present to us uh, the application for tariff review that KPC has made to, to, the, to the regulator and which, as has been said, we need to get uh, the stakeholders uh, to also consider and uh, give us their views. Now, to do that, uh, we we'll look broadly at uh, three aspects of uh, our application first. I uh, would want to present to you uh, KPC, just an overview of uh, the system that uh, we manage or the system that we own for which we are seeking a tariff uh, review. And then we'll briefly look at uh, the current tariff, uh, which was approved after uh, a similar process whereby the stakeholders had to also uh, give their views through stakeholder engagements. And then finally, uh, we'll dwell on uh, what the application is all about. Now, in terms of uh, an overview, uh, KPC, as uh, most of us are aware, uh, we were established in 1973 but we started commercial operations in 1978 uh, when the first line uh, was constructed. Uh, that was a line that uh, was running from Mombasa to Nairobi. Uh, we commenced co commercial uh, operations uh, thereafter, and our core mandate uh, is really to transport, store, and deliver bulk uh, petroleum uh, products uh, to the hinterland. Of course, we also do manage some facilities at the coast region, but for the pipeline uh, tariff, our focus is on uh, delivery of uh, products into the hinterland. Uh, our market is wide. Uh, we are just not confined to the domestic market, but we also served our landlocked uh, uh, neighbors. Our aspiration really as an organization is to be a premier oil and gas company and to transform lives as we do so. So the, uh, that is the network. Uh, the pipeline system runs uh, from Mombasa to Nairobi, and uh, we have the western uh, section, which runs from Nairobi to Kisumu uh, and Eldoret. Currently, the active uh, lines are a total 1,342 uh, kilometers. Uh, we used to have 1,700 but uh, following uh, the retirement of the very first line that was constructed in 1978, uh, the length of, uh, of, of the active lines. Yeah, like I was saying, uh, we used to have 1,700 kilometers, uh, but uh, we retired the very first line that was uh, constructed in 1978, mainly because it had outlived its economic life and uh, was no longer safe uh, to, to operate. So what we currently have are uh, just one line running from Mombasa to Nairobi. Then to Western Kenya, we have parallel lines uh, running all the way from Mombasa, uh, sorry, from uh, Nairobi to Eldoret, and we have uh, the spur line that runs from Sinendet to Kisumu. In terms of storage, we do have storage depots in Mombasa, Nairobi, Nakuru, uh, Eldoret, and Kisumu. And in those particular depots, we have uh, evacuation facilities uh, through which we are then able to load trucks or transfer products to the OMCs. At the airports, we have what we call the hydrant system, which is used uh, really to uh, fuel the, uh, the aircrafts. We have dedicated jet air A1 uh, depots, that is the Embakasi depot, and the Moi International Airport depot in Mombasa, uh, which, uh, through which we are able to then provide uh, aircraft fueling services to the, uh, to the crafts, aircraft that uh, land in those particular depots.
sorry about that. Uh, the challenge is that we need to ensure that uh, uh, the online, those who are joining us uh, virtually are also able to uh, view the, the presentation. So I just want to share a little bit more of the details in terms of the capacity that, uh, uh, of the pipeline system. I've talked about the Mombasa Nairobi pipeline. We call it line one. And that line can deliver 1.3 million cubic meters in an hour, I mean, in a, per annum, one, if it is running uh, continuously. That is, if there is no out time. But of course, we do know that there are times where the system or the pipeline is down because probably of power outages or uh, issues around uh, uh, maintained maintenance and, and so on. So the system that we currently have, which really is the backbone of the pipeline, uh, can give us uh, 8.3 if it is running uh, fully 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. Then we have the Nairobi Eldoret line. Uh, we have two lines. We have the very first line that was constructed in 1994, and we have uh, the, the first line, uh, line two, can be able to give us 1.8 million.
and, and throughput was affected. But the tariffs uh, were retained as, um, as had been approved. And as the DG has mentioned, we did take a hit, especially in the year that ended uh, 2022. One of the key things that we were requested to do even uh, during uh, the sessions where we had stakeholder engagements uh, in uh, 2019 was to carry out a tariff unbundling exercise so that uh, we are able to uh, provide transparency in terms of what it costs to provide uh, the different services that uh, we offer. Now we've been able to do that and uh, we've unbundled the tariff into two. We have the transportation component uh, which is really a per kilometer tariff and we have a storage and hand and loading tariff, which is really uh, the tariff that then uh, takes care of the storage and loading service that we offer at, at, at the depots. So those are the figures uh, that, we, that uh, we were able to derive after we went through uh, the exercise of separating the, 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 the assets and the, the OPEX for the various services. So as it is now, uh, the unbundled tariff for 2021-22, which is still uh, in effect uh, after being extended uh, by EPRA, is, uh, is that we have a transportation tariff of three shillings and 56 cents uh, per kilometer per cubic meter. And then we have a storage and loading tariff of uh, 696 Kenya shillings uh, per cubic meter. Now, during the engagements in 2019 also, there were concerns around our efficiency and look at what it is we needed to improve on. And we realized that uh, the biggest issue was on at the depots, uh, loading of, uh, of, 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 of the trucks. And we did engage with KRA and are currently uh, working on a project which we call the Systems Integration Project uh, between KPC and K KRA, because we did notice that uh, the major hurdle was really the, ever, I mean, the clearance of, uh, of uh, vessels at the Western Kenya uh, depot. So we are engaging with KRA, but uh, we as there were so many orders that would be rolled over to the next day uh, but uh, after rolling out the customer to load all orders that are raised uh, in a day within uh, the day. Full integration is still in process and we hope to achieve that uh, in due course. Another improvement that we have done is really to install or upgrade our bottom loading facilities. Uh, we did realize that bottom loading facilities are, are more efficient and we have been installing more of those in uh, the Western Kenya depots. It's a project that is ongoing and um, our target, of course, uh, with the uh, support around importation of products. If previously the old terminal could only uh, bath one vessel at a time, uh, but the new terminal can bath three vessels uh, at the same time. 
So there's a lot of improvement in terms of uh, the receipt or, uh, of, of products, of the imports. And uh, of course, as KPC, we also need to look into our capacity at the coast region to receive the products and we're having projects that will ensure that we increase our import uh, storage facilities. So having looked at where we are currently, um, what then are we applying for as KPC? Uh, as has been mentioned, the tariff control period has ended for the tariff that was approved in uh, February has already ended. And we did make an application to the regulator on 18th uh, January. We've had uh, some engagements with them and uh, which really culminated into an addendum on that tariff application that we submitted on 18th of July 2022. The reason why we needed that, an add that addendum was because in our initial tariff application, we had not uh, factored in the capital requirement uh, for enhancement of the eastern section uh, flow rate. So that has already been approved. Uh, we've already gotten our board's approval and we have submitted to the Treasury a proposal to enhance the capacity of the eastern section uh, by installing a new line. And if allowed, uh, we should uh, be having a new line running from Mombasa to, to Nairobi. Uh, and of course, as the DG had mentioned, uh, that addendum was also necessitated by the fact that we needed to be realistic in terms of the throughput that we could achieve as KPC. The tariff principles have not changed from where they were in 2019 when we uh, made our application and had the stakeholder engagements. The principles remain the same as uh, have been given uh, by the regulator. And what then we are allowed in terms of working capital is that uh, our cash can only be determined as 45 days of the operating and maintenance expenditure and the inventory determined as a 2% of the fixed assets. So for purposes of tariff determination, that is the working capital that we are allowed. Now the capital structure allowed is 20% equity and 80% uh, debt. Uh, return on equity portion of capital uh, that is allowed is 10.5%, uh, that is as given by the regulator. And then the cost of debt for the, uh, for the debt portion of capital uh, is really pegged on the, uh, the current uh, interest that we pay on the, running, uh, on the running debt that we have. And the running debt that we have was the one that we took for construction of line five. And it is uh, based on a labor of three months and uh, a margin of 4.5%. So all these really are, are key in determine, determining what our revenue requirement is as KPC. So let's have a look at what the tariff inputs are. Uh, the tariffs are informed by uh, three major inputs. The first one being the regulated asset base. Uh, the second being the operating and maintenance uh, expenses and lastly, the throughput. So in terms of regulated asset base, uh, we see ourselves growing from 85.9 billion Kenya shillings to one, 104 billion Kenya shillings by the year 2024-25. And this really is, uh, is uh, because of uh, the investments that we already have lined up, as has been called out, we are putting up a new line, and that is going to cost us uh, quite a bit of uh, capital. Uh, we also have other projects that uh, we are working on and uh, all aimed at ensuring that the system is sustainable. Eldoret line, we shall be installing uh, additional uh, pumps so that we can be able to boost the flow rate uh, on that section from 350 uh, to 500. That is the flow rate for that particular line. We shall also be looking at increasing our storage capacity. As it is now, we are having some uh, operational challenges because of the storage constraints that we have 
on the western section and uh, this uh, application also considers uh, investment in storage capacity mainly in, uh, in Eldoret and Kisumu. So as it is now, because we are talking about unbundling the assets uh, for pipeline or for transportation of petroleum products, uh, really stand at 77% of the total uh, asset base that we have. And when you talk about regulated asset base, uh, that is to mean that not all the assets in our register are allowed for purposes of tariff determination. Uh, there are those that are taken out mainly because they do not really contribute towards uh, provision of uh, the transportation services uh, that uh, the tariff is being sought for. And that includes, for example, the school that we, that, that we run, the Mayog um, Morendat Institute of Oil and Gas. Those assets are not included here. And we've also taken out the assets for the Kipevu oil storage facility because it's not used for transportation of products to the hinterland. The other key inputs that I'd mentioned is the operating uh, expenses, that is the operating and maintenance expenses, which is very key for us as KPC to be able to continue delivering uh, on our mandate. And uh, we've uh, requested for a growth that the OPEX be allowed to grow by 6%. Uh, we are cognizant of the fact that, yes, uh, times are hard, but uh, we also know that uh, the cost of doing business is going up. And for KPC, uh, who has to source some of uh, the material from outside the country, we are also suffering the impact of the foreign exchange. But we have uh, deliberately uh, decided to uh, keep that uh, expense at the bare minimum and to work on our own internal systems to ensure that there is efficiency and, and cost control. So we are requesting that the operating uh, expenses uh, be allowed uh, that we be allowed should uh, increase from 11.5 billion Kenya shillings uh, to 13.3 billion Kenya shillings by the year 2024-25. Then lastly, in terms of the inputs, is the throughput. Uh, the throughput projections, uh, as we see it, we see that uh, the domestic market uh, is going to grow. Yeah, there have been some uh, disruption. Uh, the COVID, disrupt, COVID happened, uh, demand went down, but the economy has bounced back, and we did see some growth in terms of demand. There has been uh, disruptions early this year that we are all aware of. Uh, the elections also have affected demand, but we, are still, we still are optimistic that we shall recover. And from the previous trends, we have seen that uh, where there has been a, a, a decline because of external factors, the economy normally recovers very fast and uh, demand then also uh, usually goes up. So we are projecting on a, uh, that throughput is, uh, sorry, that demand is going to grow uh, from 5.79 that had been projected uh, as of last year to grow to about 6.6 uh, million cubic meters by the year 2024-25. And as I mentioned, uh, this particular uh, tariff is looking at transportation to the hinterland. So we do have to take out the, the consumption for the coast region. And what we are left with, therefore, for the hinterland is 5.8 uh, million cubic meters by the year 2024-25. Uh, this is really a very optimistic projection. Uh, but uh, we are confident that the economies will grow and that uh, we shall be able to grow to that level in terms of demand. We also handle the transit products. Uh, we, the, 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 the imports through the port of Mombasa have been growing. Unfortunately, there has been some disruption also because of COVID and what happened early this year. And of course, the elections, uh, because uh, the, the landlocked countries that we serve uh, when, the, when the elections are due, normally consider the alternative uh, modes of getting products into their, into their country. And uh, we do know that uh, quite a number of them activated the central corridor, and we saw some shift of volumes to, this, uh, to the central corridor. But we are glad that the electioneering period has been peaceful and it is now over. And uh, with the kind of efficiency and cost efficiency that we do offer, we are optimistic that uh, they are going to come back to the Northern Corridor, and therefore we, remain, we retain our projections of growing the imports, transit imports from 3.6 million 
uh, cubic meters in 2021-22 to 4.15 million cubic meters by the year 2024-25. So in terms of what as KPC then we can handle, that unfortunately has been constrained by the capacity that we have. As I had mentioned, uh, the eastern line um, uh, uh, is, is constrained and from where we sit, we see that we can only be able to move 8.12 million cubic meters in the next two years before the capacity enhancement project is, is, uh, is, is, is done. But in 2024-25, because the target is to have the capacity for the Eastern Line enhanced by December 2024, we have factored in the growth that we shall see in the second half of that financial year. That is why you are seeing that uh, the throughput then grows from 8.1 million to 8.6 million cubic meters in 2024-25. So those are our projections in terms of uh, volumes. They're optimistic, but uh, we are confident that uh, if, the, if, 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 if the peace that we're already experiencing <coughs> prevails and uh, we are able to provide uh, cost-efficient uh, services, we should see, therefore, that uh, more products come in through the port of Mombasa and uh, through the pipeline. So what then are we asking for as KPC? We normally consider the, uh, the composite tariff, uh, because that is, what, uh, that is how the, the model has been structured to first of all determine what the composite tariff would be and then it is then uh, broken down into the transportation component and storage and handling uh, component. Now when you look at the composite tariff, we are asking uh, for a tariff adjustment from 4.61 uh, Kenya shillings per cubic meter per kilometer and asking for a 13% uh, adjustment to 5.22 Kenya shillings per cubic meter per kilometer. That uh, is a 13% uh, growth. Uh, thereafter, it will grow to by 6% to 5.53, and then start dropping to 5.50 5 uh, Kenya shillings per uh, cubic meter per kilometer. Now, the reason why you are seeing that kind of growth is because of the investment that uh, we have already talked about, and the fact also that uh, the tariff is, I mean, the throughput. Uh, is not growing in the next two uh, financial years. So contrary to what has uh, been uh, projected uh, out there, the growth is not 36%, the growth is 13%. And we are dropping in the, sub in the last year because tariff is going up and at that particular time, then we will not be having significant addition to invest uh, to, to, the, to the asset base. So what does this mean to the uh, this, that does this mean for the depots? Uh, the tariffs will be as shown on the screen. Uh, what uh, we shall be seeing really as is a huge increase in, uh, in Nairobi and Na in Nakuru and some moderate kind of uh, adjustment in Eldoret and Kisumu, mainly because of the unbundling process. This is because of the unbundling process, as it is the previous tariff was a per kilometer tariff. When you take out uh, the storage component and make it a, a per cubic meter then tariff, you therefore expect that uh, the Eldoret and Kisumu tariffs will not grow as much as the Nairobi tariffs, which enjoy some kind of, uh, uh, where we saw some kind of uh, subsidization in the previous tariffs. So as it is uh, in Nairobi, the, 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 the rates will go up from 2,074 Kenya shillings per cubic meter to 2,617 uh, Kenya shillings per cubic meter. In Nakuru, the rates will go up from uh, 2,853 currently and will go up to 3,271. Uh, in Eldoret, the rates will go up from 3,669 uh, to 3,957. Uh, in Kisumu, the rates will go up uh, from 3,664 3, to 3,953. And then I think COSA is going to benefit from the unbundling process uh, if approved, because uh, then their tariff is going to take out the storage component of the previous tariff. And we see the COSA tariff go down from 1,761 uh, per cubic meter to 1,000 
479 shillings per cubic meters. So those are the rates. As I've mentioned, uh, because of the unbundling, you'll see that the growths at the different depots are different. And uh, that now takes care of the fact that storage cannot be a per kilometer rate, but it really should just be a per cubic meter rate. Uh, so uh, we've also looked at the impact of what we are proposing on the Monainchi, on all of us in terms of what we shall have to pay uh, additional on the pump price. So the impact of this uh, tariff uh, application or tariff uh, adjustment request is really going to see the pump prices go up in Nairobi by 54 cents per liter, and in Nakuru by 42 cents per liter, and in Eldoret and Kisumu by 29 cents per liter. Like I mentioned, there's that disparity because of uh, the unbundling process. <laughs> We've also looked at uh, the contribution of, uh, our, of, the, of the tariff to the overall palm price. And uh, in Nairobi, if we just focus on super, in Nairobi, uh, the palm price, I mean, the pipeline uh, transportation and storage tariff is going to contribute 1.3% to the total uh, palm price. And uh, in Nakuru, the tariff is going to contribute 1.8% to the total palm price. Eldoret and Kisumu, it's going to contribute about 2.3% to the total pump price. Uh, there have been concerns about whether we are competitive, and we've checked ourselves against the only other mode of transportation that currently exists in the region, I mean in the country, and that is uh, for road <laughs> transportation. And uh, we've used, uh, assumed a road transportation rate of 6.7% shillings per cubic meter per kilometer. Uh, that really uh, what we got gathered was the lowest rate that the OMCs are able to get. And uh, if you compare our tariff or transportation tariff with that lowest rate, we are 40% 40, 40 lower. We've also checked on what it will cost on whether we are competitive when you look at uh, the transit movement of transit material. And uh, we've assumed uh, transportation by pipeline and transportation by road from Mombasa. As it is, if you receive products at our facilities in, in Mombasa, transport by, by pipeline to Eldoret and Kisumu, then by road to Kampala, uh, what uh, the landed cost will be uh, $74. Uh, 74 US dollars uh, per cubic meters. But if you then receive uh, the products at the uh, other facilities in Mombasa and you transport by road, then the landed cost in Kampala will be $90, $80, which is the lowest if you come in through, if you bring your products through VTTI, or $92 uh, if you bring in your products uh, through Shimanzi. That is $92 per cubic meters. So that really is our application. Uh, that is what our request is. And uh, this is what we are presenting to you to consider and uh, allow uh, so that as KPC we will be able to continue to, to serve you and uh, deliver for you the products uh, at the various depots. Thank you very much. I hand over to EPRA. I think you all appreciate that uh, that was a very concise and very clear presentation. Or don't you agree with me? I think it was. She deserves another clap, isn't it? Because this is one of the easy applications that uh, we receive at, at, at EPRA, considering that there are sometimes a lot more complicated applications that you receive on other regulated uh, facilities. 
and that makes it a little easier for us uh, uh, to be able to make a contribution with respect to what has been given to us. And I think the only thing you need to look at are just basically four aspects. You look at how the assets are going to grow over the regulated period. That is the regulated asset base. And this grows from 5.9 billion to 104 billion. Simple. During the tariff control period. And that will go into expansion of storage investments in the western part of the country and construction of a new line in the eastern section. Then there will be a small growth in operational expenses or OPEX by 6%. So that grows from about 11 billion to 13 billion. I am trying to summarize the critical issues here. There will be a growth in throughput. That is, and there will be a growth in demand. So you need to know that um, throughput is what the, the, the pipeline moves. Demand is the total amount that needs to be moved. So our demand grows from about 8.8 uh, uh, meter cubed, million meter cubed, to 10.4. And KPC will be will be KPC throughput growth will be from 7.62 to 8.62 if we allow the investment that has been requested for in the eastern part. So, and then there will be um, an overall growth in the tariff, the composite tariff that is being asked for by 13% in the first year and a further 6% the following year and then a reduction of 0 0.5 the last year which is a product of the benefits that will arise from the expansion of infrastructure. So in other words I think what we, we should be able to learn here is that there is a likely improvement in the way business will be done as to make the cost lower as we move to the future. But the overall impact of this application is that uh, for Nairobi consumers, we will have 54 cents increase at the pump at the end of the tariff control period. And for those in the western part, it's about 29 cents. So those are the issues you are being asked to consider. Uh, and I think all of them have been explained, uh, couldn't have been explained better in terms of what will be done and the benefits therein. I am now asking uh, us to break, uh, to go and uh, discuss with ourselves the way the application has been made so that we can we come back here after 30 minutes. We will then, uh, let's make it 20 because I think we started a bit late. Uh, so we break for 20 minutes, uh, have a cup of tea, and while we come back, then we will give you an opportunity to say whether you like the application or whether you don't like it or what you agree with and what you don't agree with. And I think uh, on that note, I want to thank you very much for giving us the attention. We will have both KPC and EPRA to respond to your issues. Thank you very much and let's break. There is tea outside. Tea is just outside.
check. One, two, check. Okay. Good after break. There is a lot of people still outside, eh? and we want to reconvene. Naomba wale ambao muko nje tafadhali mukaribie tuendele. Those who are outside, please join us. Tuendele. So once again, uh, uh, I hope that uh, you are now reinvigorated. Kwa sababu kila mtu wamepata kikombe cha chai. 
Na kama tulivyosema ni kwamba tunataka tutumie nafasi hii kuoza kuongeleshana. Tuongeleshane ndio um, tuweze tukapata majibu ya maswali ambayo huenda pengine mko nayo. Na hii ndio nafasi nzuri ambayo unaweza uh, kutoa maoni yako ama msimamo wako kuhusiana na yale yote ambayo tumeweza kupatia kwa siku ya leo. Na ndio tuweze ku uh, kuwa a bit orderly. What we are going to do is that we will be picking three questions per row and uh, then uh, directing this, the questions to the appropriate parties to answer those questions. So like I said, we have the KPC team which will be uh, coordinated by Zilpa and then we will have the EPRA team uh, under the guidance of the Director General who is with us today. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think you've heard from the horse's mouth, like we said earlier, this is only an application and we require to be deliberated on and a determination made preferably by the 22nd of October when the current extension of the tariff lapses. We would like by the time uh, that period ends that instead of having a new extension, we actually uh, have an approved tariff. So, um, I will start by taking questions from my left, left side, which could be your right side. Three questions, and who wants to go first? So uh, I hope our protocol team is, there is, so that is number one. Another person? Yes, that will be number two. And uh, another one? One more? Tutajibu hayo kwanza, and then we will come back again to the same team. So uh, say your name and your institution for purposes of record. Asante sana, mimi ni George Mungao Okonji from the Civil Society. Mwenzangu umekuja ukaanza kuongea Kiswahili. And I've attended very many forums whereby nimeimiza tuwe tukiongea Kizungu tukitranslate na kwa Kiswahili. Kwa mana, some of us are not very vast with English. Now, what you have given us is too technical that unless you translate it into Swahili, Atta, I've been interrogating bills in the parliament and I keep on telling them, lazima muwe mkiandika kizungu na kiswahili. Because we have wazes, I'm a retired mzee who is 67 years old. But I still come here to interrogate issues. Sasa ule mze ule iko na maono na awezi kuji express kwa kizungu atafanya nini. That is just an observation that what you have told us in English, there are some people who cannot who cannot find out what it is because how are you? It is technical. Mutranslate hivi kwa Kiswahili. Asante. Absolutely understood and thank you very much. Actually that is a sentiment that uh, we have received across the stakeholder consultations and I can guarantee and assure you kwamba ni jambo ambalo tunalitia kwa maana sana. Going forward pengine tutakuwa tuna summarize yale ambayo yanazungumziwa ya kwa Kiswahili ndio watu wengi wawezi kuelewa na kubaliana na wewe kabisa kwamba hilo ni jambo ambalo uh, tutalichukulia our communications team i hope you understand that and you, next time you will be able to put in place mechanisms that can allow for co uh, communication to everyone and thank you very much uh, 
Can we have the next question? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name uh, Gitu from Turbine Energy. Now, my question is, what is necessitating the expansion of the pipeline into the western region? Might be ignorant, but I've not gotten that far. All right. I hope KPC, you should be able to answer that one. Why, why, why do you want to expand the pipeline? Okay, I, 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 I was waiting for one last question from this row. Oh, yes. All right. Uh, good morning. I'm Joseph. And there is a place I didn't understand here. We have increase of price and increase of demand at the same time. Does it not affect the supply demand curve in the business industry? Uh, uh, so the question is, how is demand and supply interacting in this scenario? Yes, we have increase of supply, we have increase of price, <coughs> and we have increase of demand. Uh, Does it not affect the demand curve? I, I, I think it's well understood. We will try to answer you. Uh, I hope that Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will come to the middle row. No, uh, not because there are no more questions on this row. I will be back. But let me let's let's come to the middle row. To party Maswali kutoka up. Yes, there is one here. Uh, my name is Sylvester Makaka. It's still morning. I just want to raise maybe one or two issues. One is that uh, on the shareholding of KPC, if we could be made to understand whether it is 100%, 50%, 60% government. And then the second question to this is how does then the bottom line, projected bottom line of KPC propagate itself with the new tariffs? Whether we we getting value for money or KPC is getting money for nobody? <laughs> That's one number two. I heard in the presentation that the asset base, the regulated asset base in this context is going to change between now and 2025. So are we factoring the change in this tariff review or that change in asset base will then be adjusted at the time? And my last question is, You've uh, given KPC money, or the, they have applied for 13% increase in, I think, revenue, and then 6%, and then 0.5% reduction of discount. And the question would be, is it that they require the money now, so that in future the money may not, they don't require as much? Or what is informing this 13%, 6%, and 0.5% discount? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think are uh, very precise and well understood questions. That last one is about so what informs the changes that we are proposing in the tariffs over the tariff control period, and how comes it eventually reduces by 0.5 percent? That's the question. KPC, note that also. My name is Jane Kimani. My question is to EPRA what they can do for us what we are doing to cushion independent players with respect to the current volatility of the prices. 
All right. Okay. Good uh, morning. One, one last, yeah. Sorry. Okay. My name is Michael Rotiche from National Oil. One. There was an issue about the customer portal. We directly support other things with higher efficiencies, especially in Western Cape. So I think that is really a local to get this in. Now, in the presentation, there was an issue about the OPEX growth by 6%, which is anticipated by KPC, which is part of the parameter that is going to, to sustain the change in tariffs. My question would be why that 6%? If you look at all the industry taxes, it's about 3 to so this is the KPC. How do we arrive at that 6% increase in the Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have quite a number of issues that uh, have been asked. Before we come to the last row, we will first respond to the ones that have been asked so that uh, we are a bit systematic and so that the respondents also do not lose track of, on, of, of what they need to, um, to answer. We will, we will then come to the last row after those questions have been responded to. Um, I am informed that uh, they are, we have participants online. Uh, and I don't know how our ICT have organized for those online participants to be able to participate or to ask their questions so that we can also respond to them. Uh, thank you, David. I think uh, we shall go on for now and then we shall schedule them. All right. As all time right. Come okay. Goes, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will, before we go to the EPRA questions, I will ask Zilpa to come and uh, uh, or to coordinate the responses that have been directed to KPC. I think we have indicated which ones, uh, including the last two from uh, Michael Rotich. Uh, the issue of the, uh, I think one is just a compliment, uh, which is good. We barely get complimented, we in government. So when you hear that, it's, you are doing a good thing that you are now able to increase efficiencies to 94%. Well, we want the 100%. Of course, it's good for all of us. It's, it's indicated that uh, you are working towards that. It's a good thing. Uh, but what informs the uh, OPEX growth by 6%? All right, so uh, we will we'll, uh, answer the KPC questions. Then we will go to uh, the EPRA questions that will be responded to by... Uh, director Engineer uh, Edward Kenyua. Okay, thank you very much for the questions. Um, we apologize that um, the presentation always seems so dense and, and technical. It is a technical matter. We will try in um, subsequent stakeholder engagements to break it down even further, <coughs> even though we believed we had done it to the best of our ability. But between ourselves and EPRA, we note that for future improvement. Um, thank you as well for the compliment. Um, it takes a lot of effort to engage in any kind of improvement, whether automation-wise or technical in terms of operations. And therefore, um, the fact that you laud as you are see it, 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 it's very much um, encouragement. I think you keep doing what it's doing towards the efficiencies that the regulator needs to ensure that to achieve and that we are proud of having done it to be in capacity. In terms of what necessity from um, capacity enhancement, I will take that question as a first three, and then um, I will pass on a few questions to my colleagues. The reason why every um, three-year cycle we have what we call a control period is to review whether 
the infrastructure we have is not only sufficient but well maintained to um, facilitate the transportation of petroleum products across the line from Mombasa all the way to Nairobi and then through to what we call Western Kenya depots of Eldoret, Nakuru, and Kisumu. So markets of um, mainly Rwanda and DRC and South Sudan, there has been extreme competition for product um, supply in the system to meet what it is that you would want for your manufacturing, for your cars, for your homes, and, and, and all the other needs that you use petroleum for. And therefore, the demand that the industry currently has projected is about 1,400 to 1,500 meter cubes per hour for now to grow to an approximated 1,700 um, by the year 2027. Now, for us to actually service that differential of about 500 cubes per hour, we do need another pipeline. There's no way you can transport beyond what capacity you have built that diameter and that um, pumping rate of that pipeline to be. And unfortunately, um, enhancing the pumping stations along the existing pipeline was still not going to yield um, the flow rate that is required at an optimal cost. Because ultimately, when we review with the regulator, it's about the balancing of um, the cost benefit. And what was then agreed upon is that it is cheaper to construct a new line. So in response to that question, we currently and urgently need to pump more product from, I know you know about the new jetty in, um, the marine jetty in Mombasa, it will now receive product into the shores of um, the tanks that are in Mombasa at a bigger flow rate, at about 4,000 meter cube per hour. Then they come into this one pipeline that can only flow at about 1,000 cubes per hour you can then not do any more than that because that's the installed capacity in terms of engineering terms. So we then need to create another line that can receive more product and flow at a faster rate. And once it gets to Nairobi, we're also constrained by not just the tankage, but the pipe, cap the, the diameter, we call it the diameter of the line and the ability of that line to flow into the Western Kenya depots of Nakuru, Eldoret, and, and, um, and uh, Kisumu. And therefore, we then need to enhance the flow rate by pump capacity. So we build in physical pumps into what we're calling line four. So it is something that is operational, but then it then serves the need of the market in terms of the demand relative to the supply. So whereas we can bring in as many ships as we would want, we unfortunately cannot receive all that product into the Kenya pipeline system. So the solution would be you either take it by road comfort. It's a process that is done consultatively for us to agree on what is the sizing of this pipeline, what is the need for this um, enhancement, and therefore the regulator also gives us their builds into why, why would you prefer this option of enhancement over another. So I, I, I pray that that um, gives you satisfaction that what then we present in the tariff build-up is reasoned. Uh, the second one um, about supply and demand nexus has been answered. There is a deficit between what the market wants and what our system can pump, and that's why we have to do the enhancement. Um, in terms of the pump prices, 
um, the pipeline capacity, as we indicate to you, doesn't directly impact on the, fuel, the price of fuel. That is something around the operant dynamics of oil and gas, not just in Kenya, but internationally. So this tariff that you're looking at does not really have anything to do with the influence of supply and demand um, beyond um, the pump price that you have. That pump price is determined by very many factors, most of which will be international because we source our petroleum products purely from uh, markets outside of Kenya as refined petroleum products. Um, in terms of KPI, Parent Ministry, the Ministry of Petroleum and Mining. Therefore, no stick in KPC is held by any private interest or interest outside of the government of Kenya. And this has been so since 1973 when we were incepted. Um, in terms of value for money, we would, um, we would argue, as I have said, the value comes through prudent costs, it comes through efficient operations, it comes through meeting the demand. So whatever built-in costs that are in this model or in this tariff application ultimately yield value for money because if you see um, the application, there's an element of return on investment of 10.5% that's been in in incorporated, meaning whether we're sourcing for debt or we're using our own retained earnings, i.e. equity, it is um, assessed that the cost of funds will generate an asset that will still be able to yield a return to the shareholder. In this case, the National Treasury, who holds it in trust for the public, that is the Kenyan consumer. So in terms of value for money, in terms of the plain economics of it, we cannot propose an asset that cannot yield a return. So in terms of revenue and financial aspects only, there is a value for money there. In terms of the response to the market need to curb the difference between the demand and supply gap, then this is why this tariff application is even more necessary because it is estimated that with these enhancements you will have easier, greater access to fuel and at a more cost effective um, price. The issues you have in terms of petroleum pump prices are beyond the local economy and as the DG has said several, even in the various Pressers is a matter um, to do with the international supply chain, which I'm sure EPRA can speak more to. Um, I would like to see the floor again to my colleague Elizabeth to speak a little bit about the regulated asset base and um, whether it's included in the three-year period of the application and then the incremental staggering of the tariff um, in terms of percentages between the three years, why that is so and why it seems to oscillate. And then finally, I will give the question on the growth in OPEX to our GM Finance, who can just give uh, a brief statement on how those costs are grown and why they are capped at 6% and how that compares to the industry standard. So, Elizabeth, you can take over. Thank you, Zilpa. Now, uh, the issue of the asset base, as I presented, what we have really is a regulated asset base, and uh, it's based on the net book value of the assets that we have. And there are some assets that are not allowed for purposes of uh, determination of the tariff. So those particular assets, we look through our register and uh, EPRA normally also go through our register and we take them out when we are computing uh, the tariff for product transportation and storage. Now the reason why you are seeing the growth is really what we've been talking about, the need for investment in the pipeline uh, capacity, the need for investment in the storage uh, capacity, and of course if you are going to invest uh, a funds or you're going to incur capex, then uh, you expect then that uh, your asset base goes up. So we have been allowed, uh, uh, the model as structured and as allowed by EPRA, we are allowed to capture the assets as we bring them as they are onboarded over the years and that's why we are seeing that growth. 
the growth that had indicated uh, that the asset is going to asset base will increase from uh, about 86 billion to 104 billion Kenya shillings. So it is just a reflection of the capital investments that we are going to have, the addition to the, to the asset base that we are going to have over the three-year period if we are allowed to invest as we have proposed in our application. As I'd also indicated uh, in my presentation, the tariff really yeah, is informed by three things, the, the asset base, uh, the OPEX, and, uh, and, and, and throughput. If one is growing, say if the asset base is growing and uh, throughput remains constant, you expect the tariff to go up. If the asset base is co remains constant and uh, throughput grows, you expect the tariff to go down. So in this particular case, we are seeing a situation where the asset base is going to grow in the next two years significantly with the investments we are proposing. But because of the capacity that we keep on talking about, we are not able to grow throughput. So what then happens is that uh, the, 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 the throughput, I mean the tariff would then have to go up. So that is why you are seeing the adjustment from uh, by 13% in the first year because then we shall have uh, started off our projects, our key projects. You see another growth in the second year because the projects will be continuing and then you see a decline in the third year because that is when we'll, uh, we'll finish the projects. Uh, but uh, then at that particular time, we've also reflected the benefit in terms of throughput that we shall realize uh, when the assets are, are onboarded. So basically... You. Because if you don't, it means then that you'll go for the more expensive option for, for delivering uh, to, get, to get your products to the, to, the, to the consumer. So that is what has really impacted on the change, and that is why you are seeing the 13%, 6%, and 0.5% uh, decline. When we looked at the current tariff, we demonstrated that uh, there was a drop uh, from 2019-20. It was at about 5.07%. It went down to 4.81 in 2020-21 and, drop, and dropped further to 4.6. That is just because of those inputs, how they have played out or how we had projected them to be during that tariff control period. The asset base was going to remain fairly on the, at the same level and throughput was growing. So we see a situation in the future that once we've done... I hope that answers it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I'll take the the question uh, by our teacher Michael. Uh, regarding the growth of the op op OPEX or the operating cost of 6%. And I think uh, Michael alludes to the fact that the growth in the industry is uh, to the tune of 3%. One, I need first to clarify that the operational of um, a pipeline infrastructure is a bit different from purely operating a depot. Uh, because if you look at a depot and there's no pipeline, when it comes to the drivers or costs, of course, you realize that they are a bit different. Because, like for the pipeline, uh, you need to continue maintaining the pipeline just to ensure that there is a sustainability and um, there's no disruption in terms of. Uh, so, I think the 3% is a bit low. What we do is to look at what is it that is going to sustain the operation of the pipeline. And one of the things we do is to work on efficiencies. If you look at the 6% that is being proposed and um, you look at even the inflation rate, 
and obviously one of the key drivers for cost is you have to consider what will be the inflation um, what is it that you will require to be able to um, to sustain your business and obviously you look at how you are going to optimize in terms of uh, making sure that your costs are, are as low as possible um, 6 percent in our view is a very stretched target and these are discussions that we had even with EPRA because they also look at um, our efficiency at the end of the day like um, my colleagues have mentioned we are fully owned by the government and all the money that we generate even when you see us doing a good bottom line is not that uh, EPRA are giving us tariff to go and report profits we have to uh, set our assets we And you can attest to the fact that in the last about three or so years, KPC has been one of the main contributors to the to the national or the consolidated fund in terms of um, of giving dividends, which which go towards supporting the national agenda. So um, j just to give comfort that this six percent is a very very stretched target. You've seen the kind of investments that we want to make. Depreciation alone. Um, we will we'll hit us after we, we, we implement this course. And if you look at our cost for the last and our numbers are the part of the and the website you can look at them. Our average compounded growth is, is about 9%, which is really, really a good measurement to compare where we are and the environment that we are working, working uh, on in terms of uh, the inflation and everything else. So just to give comfort that this 6% is a number that we've really looked at uh, seriously. But granted, we still internally try as much as possible to work on uh, uh, optimizing our costs just to ensure that if we can go below the 6%, then good for everyone. So thank you very much. Um, I, I hope that answers the question. a question from that side that was not uh, adequately answered but if there is you still have uh, you'll have an opportunity to seek for a clarification so let me now invite uh, Edward Kinua to come and uh, answer on behalf of EPRA we will still have a, a wrap up from the director general at the end of the process so for those who may want to direct anything to him he will come in at the end of the process. Uh, I think there's a question that was asked around uh, the issue of uh, purchase price. Uh, I think it's a wholesale price at the depot by independent petroleum retail outlets. And let me say, first of all, that uh, out of the 4,270 stations that we have in the country, independents are quite a number. We have over 60% as independent stations, which is quite a huge number of uh, uh, players in the sector. And of course, you know, federal stations are the last mile connectivity between when we import this product, it comes to Mombasa, it is transported by pipeline to the hinterland, as KPC was saying, and then of course, for you to be able to get it into your car, you need to go to a retail station. So we don't take that, that number lightly. It's a huge number, and these are part of our biggest stakeholders. Uh, of course, uh, we are all aware that uh, prices of petroleum products in the world have gone up, and I think governments across the world are struggling to ensure that consumers are cushioned. And I think in Kenya, you are aware that uh, from April 2021, the government of Kenya came up with a stabilization process. And key among uh, the items that we factor in the price is that uh, stabilization process. Uh,
times they'll go to zero and currently we are operating on a zero margin environment and government what it does is that once that product is sold after some time it reimburses the importers so it is quite a unique situation and uh, we are just uh, uh, thanking the players especially in the retail sector Pain down the stream and that's why some of you have realized that uh, the prices you are getting are not very good because of the depressed margins. Uh, however, we have seen the situation has uh, improved quite a bit. Prices in the international market have quite improved now and I think we, pe we could be going back to the normal time sooner than later. And this is not a unique scenario in this country. It has affected even the developed world. You can see the gas prices in the U.S. where they were. And it has put a lot of pressure to the government of the U.S. and also in Europe you've seen countries like France, they are reporting very high inflation rates, countries like the U.K. So it is a s unique scenario which uh, for the many years we have also worked in this industry, we've never been in that scenario. Of course, you know oil prices are affected by geopolitical issues and we know what is happening in Ukraine and Russia. But we pray that uh, we'll go back to a normal uh, kind of cycle so that we can also be able to have a uh, new cushion in terms of economics. But that aside, in terms of uh, the independence, uh, even in the normal circumstances, sometimes because you are buying from the spot market, or you go to a depot and you find that they have displayed prices, uh, you have company A, B, C, D, and then you look for the lowest one, even if it means it's in matters of sense, it makes a lot of difference. Uh, what we have seen the independents do is that they have come together and formed associations, like now you are aware there's a POAC, the Petroleum Outlets Association of Kenya. I don't know whether Martin Chomba is around. He normally government. Instead of you having 4,270 retailers conversing their issues like with government, you have a representative through POAC and it is the same vehicle that you can use to be able to negotiate for prices with the, the importers. And I think I can see Petro City is here, Fossil is here. Uh, in the last uh, uh, cycle of shortage that we had in April, I think they played a very important uh, part in ensuring that uh, petroleum products got into the market and especially in the interior areas of this country where shortages were being reported. Uh, they were able to engage with POAC and uh, they agreed on a price. I believe they were given a discounted price. It was EPRA minus a good margin because they had assured of, of taking that product. The problem we have in buying in the spot market is that up you can come up together again as an association and decide to apply for a license and you become an importer uh, then uh, you will be able now to access products through the open tender system and then you can be able to enjoy the good discounts I think there's one association called Kenya Independent Petroleum Distributors Association Kipenda which we have given a license for import and uh, they came together as 
distributors of petroleum as retailers and they were able to meet the requirements that we have prescribed for our licensing and now they have a license. So those are the avenues that you can utilize to be able to efficiently uh, access this product at a better price. Thank you. Edward, uh, I also want to indicate, particularly to the independents, that uh, we are beginning another process of reviewing the pricing formula through what we call a cost of service study. So we hope that uh, at the end of, probably at the end of the financial year, we will have engaged someone to engage with you so that you tell us which costs you think need to be considered or not to be considered in that pricing formula and which then will find their way into the regulation that governs pricing. I have always told you that if you want your issues to be considered, understand the processes that can allow your issues to be considered. And that is one such way. We will engage during the process. Uh, there will be a stakeholders forum like this one. Show up and tell us what you'd want to see. Because sometimes they say, if you are not on the table, you are the what? You are probably the menu. Okay. So now, uh, I want to continue uh, with our discussions today. Uh, and I think we had not engaged with this role. So can we have uh, questions from this role who wants to go first? Upande who? Sioni mutu. Or can I assume that uh, you are still thinking, so I can still go back to the first row. Anybody with an issue on this row? Uh, so the gentleman at the farthest, and then you come second. Let me thank those who have made this meeting. To Director General, who is owning EPRA? The second question, who can make positive decisions to EPRA? Third question, there have been a lot of outcry outside there. Mafuta imeenda juu, mafuta imeenda juu, kila kiti imeenda juu. Here now today we are. What has been the challenges of the position of EPRA before fuel, go, fuel goes up and comes down? Fourth question. Could you could you put place, place this EPRA on the stock exchange so that Wananchi on it, they will be having decisions, they will be, they will be meeting wherever there's challenges and problems instead of somebody on it. Because if somewhat, something depends, I mean, owned by the government, because from where we are, anything to the government is even Kitia Serkali. So the workers will also, even the experts and whatever, they will say, oh, here is But if it is owned by individual Kenyan individuals, instead of association,
values of the Nepali people. Well, all these, all these poets, such, such people. Now, as you say, yes, there, there are challenges outside. Russia, where? Can we have a big store in Kenya to store oil? But whenever do we have a problem, that one will make us go for five years or ten years. I think because I'm not an expert to ask what you have been, because I have not get any. Uh, uh, you, you, are, you are giving out figures and whatever. That one I avoid. Because that one was your, your, your side. But that mine is to make sure that Kenyans get enough oil for 10 years or 15 years to come. Who can make that one? I think I'll, I'll ask later. Do, ask the those ones first. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and, I, and I believe you are well understood. Oh, my name is Chami. Who? Chami. Who names? Alois Chami. Alois Chami. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Who owns EPRA? Who can make positive decisions with respect to EPRA? What is the challenges that EPRA is facing with respect to pricing? Uh, is EPRA eligible for being in the stock exchange? Can we take them to the stock exchange so that they are owned by the public? And then how does EPRA consider stakeholder consultations in its decision making? And of course, the last one, which I think, Edward, you will answer. The, the others are uh, Director General's questions. Uh, the last one is on uh, stocks. So I think you need to say something about strategic versus operational stocks. And can we have 20, 15, 10 year stocks so that you don't talk about volatility of supply and therefore volatility of price? Edward, maybe you'll say something. All right. Another, uh, yes. Uh, <coughs> thank you. It's me again, George Mngao Okonji. This time is not an observation. Niswali. Uh, sometimes back, Niswali to KPC. KPC had a problem of oil spillage oil siphoning and oil leakage kwa mapipe zao nataka kujua kama walizuluisha hii problem because at the end of the day when such a problem occurs the common man ndio analundikizwa the losses si ndio hivyo si mna agree with me Sisi ndiyo tunaambiwa okay hii mosquitoes wale wananunuanga mafuta wana complain wakisha complain hiyo mafiga zao kisha piga piga sisi tunaambiwa bus uh, one liter of uh, kerosene will now be 200 shillings alafu wanachukua hiyo wengine wanalipa mosquitoes wale wame complain kwa mafuta yao imefanya nini imetiririka have used the words Siphoning, siphoning ni wizi, eh? na hii mambo ingine, spillage, na mambo ingine, hii ingine, ya leakage. There is a history behind it. Just give us in brief to elewe tu alafu tuta ridika. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's, that's a very, it's a very pertinent question. Uh, and I think the question revolves around two issues. How we are managing losses across the pipeline system. What are the strategies that are in place to manage those losses? Are they passed through to consumers in the pricing formula? That is a question. It doesn't matter whether there are spillages or whether there are leakages or whether they are, uh, the, whatever it is, but they are losses. So how they find their way 
to the consumer pricing system and what strategies there are in terms of managing them. Uh, that one I think I will, uh, uh, I, I, I suppose uh, uh, Director General may say something at the end of the process, but uh, we will first ask KPC to say something about what they have been doing with respect to those aspects. Because they are known, we have had cases of uh, uh, significant spillages and sometimes outright theft and how it is being managed. So Zilpa, I think you'll say something about that. Uh, and then I want to take one last question. Yes. I'm All right. here. Okay. My name is uh, Tabu Charles, Chairman Bungela Wazalendo. And I think in terms of translation, translating to Kiswahili, you can get, just give us that contract. We can do it for you. Kama Wazalendo, tuna maswala amba tuna yodokezea. Lakini kwa maswali yangu, ama vipengea amba nimetenga, ambayo nigependa kuuliza kidogo tu. Let us go back to this booklet, Corporate Profile. Eh? My question is based on monetary from... Uh, I'm trying to find out if you normally consult with NEMA to ask the complaint of the public. I'm addressing this question in line of downstream in your chart, in your page. It is page 10. I'm seeing the down, downstream petroleum uh, marketing there. But from your chart, I've not seen elaborative report on it, whereby it can, th that is where the consumer is and where the consumer can raise his, more of his concern. Eh? If you look at uh, page 5ZDD of your chart, you, you have talked about a Z, eh? ZDD, eh? Klaus DD. You, you talked about investigate, investigate complaints or dispute arising from petroleum operations. But we, don't, we have never seen you having that collab with the NEMA so that you get the reports. Because most of the complaints are in concerning the environmental aspect of these issues are normally raised to the state agency that is called NEMA. And we find that on page 11 of the same chart, page 11 of the same chart, Sorry, let me finish with the page five first. There is also uh, ZAA, whereby you have said that you take such action as, in, as is necessary to enforce the requirements in a petroleum agreement and regulations and so forth. But you are coming to realize that most of these trucks that are transporting petroleum, they have that we call... Uh, they are allocated uh, resident spaces as a storage uh, areas. So we are much concerned, regardless that they are, they are not having the petroleum with them or they are not having the component with them, that they are empty. We don't trust them. And then we have taken a study in this line of these uh, garages that are owned by these people are transporters. We as residents, we, are, we feel insecure because we have come to realize the the Eastlands areas is the more notorious with this kind of storage. So we are we are raising these complaints to NEMA, and we have never seen any reaction coming either from you. And I've discovered just because of this downstream, the downstream picture that is on page 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 ten, and also in your in, in this your your corporate profile, you have not elaborated the downstream. You have elaborated the, the, the other upper streams, mm. upper streams, more and midstream, probably, than the, the downstream. So we find that in terms of environmental impact assessment, which is supposed to be done also by the people, we have been isolated. And we find that also this kind of environmental impact assessment done by the people concerned in this uh, organ, uh, organization called NEMA, they sometimes are contracted to people who don't consult with the relevant state, uh, relevant stakeholders to avoid, uh, to avoid the, the kind of uh, probably the reaction towards the, the person who has given him the job. So we are calling upon your, 
your office to take that concern and also to make that aspect of downstream to the public. And then we shall be so happy, if at all, regularly, less allies with institutions like Bungela Azalendo, so that can give good reports. Because there are some reports you are given, but because of the business, people don't tell the truth. And you know, Kenya is a very sinful nation. I beg my rest. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and very well appreciated. Uh, I, think, I think you have raised two key concerns. One of them is uh, the issue on EPRA's role with respect to environmental management and it uh, nexus us with what NEMA is doing. I know that EPRA is a lead agency with respect to um, energy issues as they relate to the environment. So Edward, I think you'll say something about uh, that relationship. And then uh, I think uh, an, an issue has also been raised on uh, tanker parking. Uh, basically issues revolving around uh, petroleum transportation and the, and the tanks. So maybe you'll be talking about something about tanker parking and what you are doing about it. Uh, and then maybe uh, DG in his uh, presentation he will wrap up that issue. So I, I want to come to the middle section again. Uh, who is going to go first on the middle section? Anybody with an issue here? Yes. It's okay. First of all, I'd like to thank and compliment the EPRA. Out there, they're doing a good job. I've seen it with my eyes. But also my suggestion was to regulate the depots, like they've regulated the petrol stations. Because that's where we are suffering, and that's where many people, wananyonga, pump zao. Please do something about that. Edward, I think you have heard there is a job you need to be doing. How do you, how do you ensure that uh, oil marketers don't steal from uh, retailers at the depot. Uh, I saw that there are no more questions there, so I'll go to the last question before we go to responding. Thank you very much. I can see there is an issue there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my issue is not uh, concerning the K KPC, but because I've seen people raising issue on EPRA, uh, I just wanted to know, uh, industrial area, I've seen a lot of mushrooming illegal depots that uh, are selling petrol, paraffin, and most cases they must be adulterated, and uh, they are getting their ways to the public. And uh, they are being sold within the public eyes and the police are even sometimes manning those centers. Is EPRA aware about these kind of illegal uh, centers that have really mushroomed in Nairobi? And if in case, uh, what are they doing about those things? Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the, the, issue, the question there is straightforward. I, I believe you, you mean uh, illegal retail outlets, not depots, uh, and, and the issue of, first of all, they're just illegal, they're in, the uh, in the wrong places, and also could be dispensing bad fuel or adulterated fuel. Edward, again, you'll say something about that. And uh, I know that we've had a series of regulations on some of these things, so maybe you may want to uh, to talk about that. And lastly, I'll have one last question. Uh, yes. Okay, thanks very much. My name is Iniki Nyaga. We have this uh, lint. We have the linded fuel. 
We know the lind is one of the most poisonous chemical in the environment. So my concern is, is it the only component you can use uh, in as a catalyst? about it all right the question of what do you use as catalysts I know that uh, we do have the issue of unleaded fuel but if we are using lead uh, I think the whole issue is about quality Pet uh, petroleum uh, products quality. So I think that that's an issue that I will uh, direct to both Edward and also to KPC on the question of uh, quality of uh, petroleum products. So Zipa, maybe you can find the appropriate person to say something about quality. And then Edward, you'll also say something about uh, that. Okay. Uh, we will uh, we have questions that uh, were directed to us from the online team or from the online viewers and those questions are screened. Uh, so the first question was have we considered the new proposed KPC tariff competitiveness within the region for transit products? KPC I think that is a fairly straightforward question. You'll take that one. And then the other question is, there's a lot of public clamor to lower petroleum uh, prices. Will this increase be interpreted as going against the public clamor and cause some unrest? Uh, I think that one I'll uh, give it to DG to say something about it. So, um, and so that we can, uh, because I know that uh, time is also beginning to be, to constrain us, we will go straight to, uh, I think I have allocated all the questions to all the parties, and I will start with KPC. Zilpa, uh, come and answer the KPC questions. We'll then go to, Ed uh, to Edward, and then lastly, we will, uh, we will, close up the issues uh, by uh, requesting the Director General to come and not just answer the questions that have been uh, asked, but also use it as an opportunity to wrap up our discussions today. So, KPC. In relation to oil spill management, we have, um, in, in, the, in the past couple of years, there's been a concerted effort to reduce our, our pipeline losses significantly, and you will see it in the farm prices, to as low as below 0.15%. Um, we have also in, involved ourselves in acquisition of technology that will facilitate that process, including our SCADA system as well as leak detection system. These are all um, what we call instrumentation and control um, technology that assess and detect where there is possible um, infringement on the line that could possibly have led to a leak or possibility of vulnerability that could lead to a leak. So I will leave um, any further details around that to our supply and logistics manager who um, schedules the petroleum products in the pipeline to advise on further measures that have been taken to handle that. We will also speak about um, product quality on um, leaded fuel, which will only be around the petrol, uh, which I know for fact was phased out, but he will give you further details. In terms of regional competitiveness, um, there isn't much to say here because over time, the pipeline has proven since the last tariff control period to be the cheaper 
mode of transportation when combined with road from Western Kenya or even purely by road from Mombasa. And the current differential uh, ranges between six to seven dollars a meter cube, depending on which, of course, transport company you use and what rates you have negotiated. So it is indeed cheaper. Um, for the benefit of our all marketing companies in our analysis than use of road. Uh, for the other markets, of course, there are other strategies that have been employed, and I will ask Grace to close on what are being done for the market interventions in those areas. So, Karanja. Thank you, Zilpa, for uh, taking the lead on that. I think uh, world over, all pipelines, and especially pipelines that are transporting petroleum, are prone to all those kinds of uh, challenges, siphoning, uh, leakages, and uh, spillages. And Kenya has also not been an exception to this challenge that we have uh, witnessed world over. But even having said that, then we cannot rest as a company uh, just at the fact that uh, that is happening world over. What we do as a company is to ensure that we have uh, implemented the best mo model and methods of, uh, of uh, addressing possibilities of such things happening. In place, I know we have uh, what we do called patrols that we carry out on a regular basis, and that is supposed to deter any kind of uh, plans or any kind of uh, schemes that are there to uh, to affect the pipeline. Number two, we also have, uh, like she alluded to, we have technology which are uh, put in place. We have a system that is real time called uh, SCADA. SCADA just means uh, system control, accusatory da data analysis. And so what it does is that it gives us real time information about the pressures on the system. So that one, if there's any problem at any particular point of the pipeline, then we are able to pick out that quickly and address it. Remember, our stations across the whole country are, are spaced in between uh, some few kilometers, so we can quickly address a challenge that is coming on leakages or, or any kind of those solutions. Finally, solutions to do with uh, uh, ensuring that we are protecting our system, we are also going to be investing in the, uh, things like drone technology to ensure that we are able to uh, survey our pipeline the terrain across even places where probably are not motorable. And so all this is to ensure that there is no spillage. Um, another thing I would say is that losses are also part and parcel of most pipelines, and all pipelines indeed, because we find that they will encounter some percentage of losses. In KPC, we are also not prone to not having such kind of losses, but that I can tell you, and what she has said is true, that we have invested in technology and for instance, we have put in meters that are able to reduce the losage, which initially was in the way of 0.25% previously. But now, even as of now, we are able to ensure that our losses are below 1%, uh, 0.1%, sorry. And uh, that differential, you can see, it, 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 it's usually passed on in, the, in, in our computation of our prices. But you can see the effect of that is now being reduced. And EPRA can confirm that uh, the losses we are declaring as KPC have actually reduced tremendously because of use of technology. Uh, use of equipment that is going to help in giving very uh, accurate information towards the measurement and, uh, and uh, computation of the volumes that we have. I think in as far as bringing of imports into the country, it's been over 10 years now since we converted from using of lead and now we are actually, that is for Tuniki Nyaga who requested for that question, uh, we are no longer bringing leaded products. What we have is unleaded that is being imported in the country. Uh, likewise for diesel, we have reduced the sulfur content to a very low percent of 0.05, I think, percent uh, in the country. And eventually this is uh, what is happening in the industrialized countries and in the modern uh, countries. So the efforts to ensure that there's no lead that is going to affect the health of Kenyans and uh, the, the regions around is being considered. It's been there for over 10 years now, I think, uh, since we stopped using the leaded super. Now we do unleaded. That's what we import. And I think that's all I want to comment on.
right. Um, thank you, uh, Zilpa. I think the question was uh, pretty much on the marketing interventions that you had taken so that we ensure competitiveness in the region. And I think it's very important for everybody to know because we don't all come from the oil industry background that Kenya Pipeline also uh, exports the product to uh, Rwanda, uh, Uganda, DRC, and South Sudan as well. And of course, there's a Kenya Pipeline gets to Eldoret and Kisumu, then there's what we call the last mile delivery now to the export market region, that is the Uganda, DRC, and South Sudan. So there are some marketing interventions we have been taking because we realize that we have competing uh, or competing route, which is the central corridor. It's a competing route. And there are only two interventions that you can take. One, you reduce the tariff or you reduce the non-tariff barrier. So at this front, as you have all noticed, and especially if you are from the oil marketing industry, is that we have been reducing our tariff. We used to charge $54.44 a while back, and this has gone down to what has been presented today. The other intervention is on the non-tariff barriers, and now that is where we engage all the other agencies. These include the revenue agencies, uh, it also includes people like Kenha when it comes to issues uh, of axolot. Uh, one of the issues is that um, when you load products from the Kenyan or from this corridor, we are always uh, complying with the vehicle axolot limits. But now on the central corridor, that compliance is never there. And so you find, for instance, if you're loading product from Tanzania, you're able to load more than you're loading from Kenya. So we have tried to negotiate with Kenha and see how we can get waivers uh, in terms of uh, you know, the extra capacity that we can be able to load. We've also been talking to the petroleum tankers to ensure that they um, incorporate aluminum as part of their tankers or they come up with tankers that are aluminum based so that then you can be able to load more because the gross vehicle weight means it is the tear weight plus the load. So if the load is steel, then that means you will not be able to load a lot. But if it is aluminum, you can then get to load a lot from, from the northern corridor. And all these interventions are to ensure that we popularize the northern uh, corridor route as compared to the central corridor. So our engagements have been fruitful. I'm sure you have seen that uh, nowadays we have even what you call the regional electronic cargo tracking system before we used to to have ECTS, which used to take a long time. So you find that the turnaround time, uh, if you're loading from the northern corridor, takes quite a, quite a while as compared to the central corridor. Now, uh, there's a project that I think I would, I would need to bring to your attention, and this is the Kisumu Oil Jetty, and that's especially for the oil marketing companies that are here. Now, when you talk about the non-tariff barriers, if you're using the waterway transportation as the mode of transporting petroleum product, then you eliminate all these non-tariff barriers that we are talking about. Uh, this project is about to be commissioned in September, uh, or at the end of September or October, and we are hoping that you all get on board and sign up these contracts with Mahadi so that we can, we can get to use uh, the waterway transportation, that is transportation of product from Kisumu to Uganda through the waterway transportation or through the vessels and the barges. I think with that said, I'll rest my case there. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question that was asked with regard to uh, strategic stocks, whether we can have storage for 10 years so that we can, we can be able to ensure security of supply of petroleum products in the country. What I can say is that uh, we've been working on some regulations on strategic stocks. I know there are regulations that have existed on strategic stocks since 2008, uh, but uh, we were not able to actualize that strategic stock as a country. And basically, 
uh, what we are talking about here is security of supply of petroleum products. So there are two ways you can ensure security of supply is through operational stocks and strategic stocks. so that it can be able to serve the demand of at that particular point in time as we make arrangement for a replenishment. So we have drafted two regulations uh, to revise what was existent before. We have a regulation on uh, strategic stocks which is sitting now with the cabinet secretary. I think now it's already progressed to the AG's office. It is uh, progressing towards approval. And uh, of course, we have another regulation on operational stocks where oil marketing companies are expected to keep a number of days stocks so that in case there's a hitch in the supply chain, we can be able to uh, have the country run without uh, disruption. Uh, keeping strategic stocks uh, is a very uh, tricky affair and it is a balancing act between costs and of course, uh, uh, the aspect of uh, the, the period of time you want to keep. Uh, you know countries like the U.S. have very big strategic stocks. Some of that stock is stored even in canvents. These are like caves. It's underground. It's stored in form of crude. Uh, one of the things that comes with strategic stocks is the infrastructure and of course the product itself. So if you are going that direction, you have to ensure that uh, this infrastructure, you provide for it in the pricing mechanism that you have, so it will be a recoverable cost in your pricing. So the bigger your storage is, the more you'll have to pay for it. Uh, so the other thing is, uh, in terms of the product, you have to purchase that product so that that storage does not sit idle. So you'll also have to pay for that product. So it is a balancing act. And in Kenya, we have uh, seen it fit because of our streamlined supply system that we can keep stocks for between 15 and 30 days uh, to start with, and then we can progress it to 90 days. I know like the, in the European Union, they keep stocks for 90 days. Uh, and of course, you know you have to provide even operational mechanism of uh, uh, releasing that product into the market within a specific time. This is a shelf life. The product has a shelf life of like three to six months. So you'll have to provide, if you keep stocks that are worth 10 years storage, uh, I think uh, releasing that product in the market might take you forever. So it is a calculated move that will balance costs and the operations. I think there's a question that was asked uh, around uh, uh, NEMA. And David rightly pointed out that uh, we are lead agency. We collaborate with NEMA in all environmental related aspects of projects and even when we are doing accident investigations we do invite NEMA we, sometimes we do joint investigations with them before you undertake a project in petroleum be it a station be it a pipeline be it a refinery you have to undertake an environmental impact social assessment ESIA uh, when NEMA receives your report, a copy is sent to us, and NEMA cannot give you an ASIA license without our comments. So we are lead agency in terms of uh, evaluating projects, and in, uh, where we found that people have gone against or uh, are not in compliance with the law, then uh, we have provisions in our law which can uh, be able to give sanctions to that such parties. And we also work with NEMA and the Directorate of Occupational Safety and Health Services to ensure that stiffer penalties are imposed on such offenders. And a good example is uh, KPC has talked of spillages. So the spillages that have occurred uh, within the pipeline system, I think most of them we've done as multi-agency investigation. And I, one casing point is the Kiboko one, which even went to the Senate, and uh, we present joint reports there with NEMA. So I believe uh, that is a, uh, is, 
is, is a point that we've been able to converse properly as a regulator. What we are requesting from yourselves, in case you find someone is uh, operating uh, not in compliance with environmental laws and they're in petroleum, they can be reported to us. And we have our hotline number, which is 0708-444-000. So you can be able to report anonymously and we can do investigations. Uh, there was a question about tanker parking. So if you look at the Petroleum Act Section 98, Petroleum Act number 2 of 2019, it bestows uh, the, county of, uh, the county government the mandate or the, uh, that responsibility of establishing designated parkings for petroleum tankers. Uh, I have to say we've been engaging severally with the county governments along the main transport corridor, the northern corridor, starting from Mombasa all the way to our borders. Uh, we've not been able to successfully uh, establish a parking, but I can say Kisumu County government is at an advanced stage of establishing one. And I know we've also been engaging with the Nairobi Metropolitan Services and the county government of Nairobi, especially to ensure that uh, within Nairobi, because it's a highly hazardous zone, we have a designated parking for these tankers. We are also working with the Northern Corridor Authority, and I know in their, pro in their plans they have provided for designated parkings. And I'm sure this is something that will continue working with the county governments. I know Mombasa had uh, established one, which was on a private basis. These parkings don't have to be done by the county themselves. They can do a PPP, and I think Mombasa had tried it once, and it worked perfectly. I know Kisumu is uh, also gravitating towards such kind of an arrangement whereby uh, private players will come and establish a parking and then people will pay fees for that parking. What we do as an authority is to issue construction permits. If somebody is uh, the serious of uh, establishing a designated parking, so they will apply for a construction permit from us. We look at the designs. And if we are satisfied that those designs meet the requisite standards, we are able to approve it. Uh, the other one was on the issue of um, regulating uh, depots. I think uh, there was a comment that was made that uh, WEZI happens at the depots. And I think uh, we are also working uh, towards ensuring that uh, this standardization in the way measurements for petroleum are done, and we are working with the weights and measures department you realize that when the depot is receiving products from KPC, they receive a meter, a calibrated meter. When they are loading, they use a calibrated meter. When you deliver these products to your station, you use a dipstick, which is an archaic kind of uh, old style system where you are doing an alleged mark or dipping some roads in tanks and looking at a calibration chart. There's a lot of manipulation that happens around that manual system of uh, measurement. And we've raised this issue with the Department of Weights and Measures. We are working in collaboration with the industry so that we harmonize. At the station's level, you can use a meter. And this is not something that has not been done <laughs> elsewhere. I think we've seen in South Africa, all tankers have meters. So when you deliver the station, you pay for what is delivered. So once uh, Weights and Measures looks at the law and what can be revised in the law, I think that is something we can be able to uh, tackle so that we can reduce those thefts and losses. However, we, we will continue surveilling the depots at the moment uh, just to be on the lookout uh, for malpractice. The only problem is that having worked in a depot myself, I know the people who work there are uh, very tricky people. Sometimes you take a walk to go for a call of nature and you find, you find 2,000 liters is gone. And you don't know when you come to do your reconciliation in the evening, you find you are missing like 5,000 liters. You don't understand where it went. All the CCTVs can show you nothing, but uh, our people, the way they are, uh, I can tell you it is high-tech business that happens there. Yeah, so it is just to be on the lookout and see how technology can help us at the moment to be able to arrest such kind of malpractice. I think there was a question about illegal depots, uh, and uh, it is our mandate also to ensure that uh, uh, people who are operating without uh, licenses, uh, 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 they are prosecuted and they face the law. 
And uh, if you look at our act, we have powers to demolish those depots. And I think in 2018, we had a massive uh, kind of uh, operation, which was in collaboration with the National Police Service. And we were able to demolish over 50 illegal depots in the country. Uh, so I'm surprised, yes, if they are back. Uh, I'm also saying that uh, we do surveillance. Sometimes we may not reach into areas. Some of these depots are in very hidden areas. So we request that you can also report to us anonymously through our hotline. We can be able to clamp them down and uh, be able to demolish them. Because for sure those dens, uh, they don't give uh, proper quality fuel. They are the ones who are doing adulteration and uh, they are the ones who are doing uh, illegal dumping of uh, export products. So we can work hand in hand in collaboration uh, so that uh, we also, we have our enforcement uh, directorate as EPRA. We have a whole new directorate for enforcement uh, and it is well equipped. We are in the regions uh, and uh, we can be able to uh, arrest kind of, uh, those kind of malpractices in time. Uh, in terms of um, the last question was on leaded fuel. I, I think it has been ably answered that leaded fuel has been phased out. Uh, the catalyst uh, they were using was a triethyl lead, which of course uh, has lead in it, it, and because of the health consequences of lead, it was discontinued worldwide. I had the question asked, uh, the, the person who asked uh, was inquiring whether another catalyst can be used. Yes, uh, there's a, a catalyst called platinum which can be used to uh, be able to boost the octane level uh, of uh, super petrol. So these are an alternative. Thank you. I think uh, we are beginning to run short of time. I know there are other activities that uh, are awaiting some of you. Um, I want to begin the wrap-up process, and uh, to begin that, I will ask uh, Zilpa to come and uh, close their remarks on behalf of KPC, and also answer one last question, and then we will invite Director General to also uh, wrap up issues uh, revolving around EPRA and this function and to close it for us. So Zilpa. We have gotten one last uh, inquiry around what is the plan for spreading our pipeline network across the country so that it's not just um, a linear line from Mombasa to Western Kenya. Um, and for your information, we do have this plan in our strategy, a 10-year strategy that runs concurrent with Vision 2030. Ours terminates around, vision, um, around 2025, wherein we had planned to do certain things in tandem with the national um, agenda devolution of pipeline, we called it, to the counties was to run um, in tandem uh, with devolution in itself as you currently see it um, for the various counties. Um, work was done, a feasibility study was assessed and various counties were mapped. Uh, of course we wouldn't put the pipeline in every county but specific ones were identified for either a pipeline and a depot or just storage facilities. Um, of course, funding for this was going to be very, very large because we were going to spread our system from Nanyuki to Isiolo, connecting to the Lapset Corridor into, of course, um, Ethiopia, and then we were going to run all the way to the border point in Busia, and then have spa lines and interlinkages from Maungu into um, Tanzania. Now, the, the work for this was done and approved by our board. However, in the process of implementing it, various other um, priorities came up and we focus now on enhancing our existing capacity to meet your local needs so that then we would have flexibility to then devolve that pipeline once we were able to satisfy the local market. So it's to assure you that this plan is indeed um, on paper. It is approved and envisioned. It will just have to run beyond the 2025 um, hallmark because of the other priority projects that have come into place. But indeed, um, we look forward, and especially in this new administration to spread devolution further and therefore there will be more opportunities as you know Nanuki was um, expanded through the railway network into an oil um, ferrying um, town 
and you will see more of that with a ex uh, planned extension of our pipeline from Kisumu to Busia and that spar link from Taveta, um, from Maungu to um, enable us access other opportunities across the region. So I anticipate that when we're talking about the next tariff control period, you will hear about what we have done in that regard. Finally, uh, as Kenya Pipeline Company, we are very grateful for the kind of um, very, uh, assessment and, and interest that you have in our organization because it has made us better. It strengthened our governance and it strengthened our operational efficiency. Um, for us. that will work with you as we continue to grow the company and grow the oil and gas sector because as you do know we really are the only um, pipeline company in eastern central Africa that is stretching for 1342 kilometers that is still operating to this level of efficiency and that is actually envisioning growing into the 23rd century um, still running strong. Uh, on that note, we also assure you that the tariff um, application we have brought before you is fair, it is just, and it is very well thought out. The costs will be managed within that tariff. Um, anything outside of it, as you do know, the regulator does not condone, and therefore there will be no incident upon which we will spend beyond what we are allowed to. And within those costs, then we anticipate that in the next... Um, three years when we talk about tariff and we talk about KPC, you will be telling us again what you have felt the improvements are in delivery of the fuel to you in your homes. And hopefully at that point as well, we would have gotten into new projects um, as envisioned in the tariff like um, liquefied petroleum gas and then further enabled your clean cooking capability. So Mwananchi really is at the front and center of everything that we do and be assured that between us and the regulator, we are working very hard to make your lives better. So on that note, Mr. DG, please um, come and wrap it up for us. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Zilpa and the KPC team. I think first, again, is to thank everybody who has... Um, made the time to be here today. I think uh, I would want to take this opportunity first uh, to pick up on uh, some of the questions that have been asked, uh, maybe emphasize some of the points that have been made. But I think as uh, first, as a matter of clarification, one of the questions that has been asked uh, around who are we uh, as EPRA, why are we here today, what is our mandate? I think it's important that we clarify that um, one, uh, we are a creature of statute uh, as the Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority. Uh, we are a successor entitled to the Energy Regulatory Commission. And uh, we do have a mandate that's provided for in the law. What you see there in the corporate profile is a snapshot of uh, who we are and what we do. But in a nutshell, our role at a broad level is the technical and economic regulation of the energy and petroleum sectors. Uh, this is from generation in electricity to transmission to distribution and to retail of electric power. We'll also regulate the petroleum subsector sector. This is uh, from upstream. This is a new mandate under the Petroleum Act of 2019 and the Energy Act of 2019. To midstream, this is the infrastructure, the pipelines, uh, the depots, down to, to the downstream bit, which are your retail stations, your transporters, uh, both uh, for LPG and liquid fuels. Uh, we also license and accredit uh, truck drivers. So we do have quite a wide mandate. Uh, today we are here in relation to the economic bit. This is the economic regulation. 
the tariff application by KPC, which has been submitted to us, and as per the mandate in our constitution of public participation, we're here to engage with stakeholders. Stakeholders, some of the people in this room are, are quiet because uh, they work in this sector. Uh, they understand and appreciate some of the issues. Uh, there are those who are stakeholders by virtue of being consumers, those who are here by virtue of uh, being uh, public interest groups, Bunga Monainchi, and uh, we, we are here to accommodate everyone, to hear their concerns, so that then when we retreat to make a decision, we make a decision that is an informed decision, we're able then to address the concerns of Kenyans and ensure that we're able to make decisions that are best for this country. Uh, some of the questions that have been asked around uh, what is our role, and really one of the areas that I want to speak to, as I think I was raised by one of our online uh, attendees, around competitiveness. Uh, we regulate KPC. KPC is one of our licensees. We don't only approve a tariff and allow them to go and uh, do what they need to do and come back in three years. Uh, once we license them, and we license them on an annual basis, we license all their facilities as facilities, we then license them as a business, as a transporter. Um, going back to what we do in terms of economic regulation, which is based on uh, what we call revenue requirement methodology. We sit with KPC, we look at KPC and say, what do you intend to do in the next three years? Uh, what projects do you intend to undertake? Uh, one of the questions that's been asked is, how do we sit in terms of KPC's performance uh, as compared to other pipeline companies in the region? And we have actually looked at uh, some of these global benchmarks. We've compared with other countries, for, for instance, South Africa. How is KPC comparing to Transnet? both from an operational standpoint, from a technical standpoint, and also from an economic standpoint. I had KM ask a question uh, which was uh, a bit uh, loaded. Uh, I think the question here is um, uh, really the rate of return to KPC as a business and who owns KPC in terms of government. And uh, it's really a balance between providing for the revenues they require to run as a business and at the same time ensure that they're able to pay a dividend to their shareholder to run government programs. So really it's the balance that needs to be struck uh, in terms of uh, w what we approve as the regulator. We do have these indices and we do have our, our methodology in, in calculating the tariff. One of the areas that I've heard is the question around uh, technical issues, around licensing of facilities, of depots. Edward and his team uh, go about technical inspections of these depots and some of that intelligence that is coming through a forum such as today where we are talking about um, some of the challenges that you find at depots. Uh, we do have an enforcement arm at EPRA want to encourage people to be able to report some of these malpractices. Because the law, and I want to admit, for those of us who are in this sector, we have very robust legislation, from the act itself to the regulations there under. Where we need is the support and collaboration of Kenyans, whether you are an OMC, you are a depot owner, you are a truck owner, you are a Kenyan, to be able to tell us uh, what is happening on the ground, so that then we as the regulator are able to enforce the law in the manner in which it was intended so that then we make the country better. One of the big questions that has been asked, and it's a theme that has cut through everybody's uh, sentiments today, is really the competitiveness of KPC, the competitiveness of our sector at a macro level. We are competing not only amongst ourselves, but as a region. I think Zilpa has mentioned a central corridor uh, coming out of Dar es Salaam. We look at this and also look at the bigger picture. How are we remaining competitive as a region to ensure that we're able to serve not only the local market but the transit market as we look at this tariff application. We also need to look at it in terms of how do we ensure we strike the right balance. Uh, as KPC, as our licensee, as an investor, we need to ensure that the system that they run remains technically sound. That will require investment. And so that then one of the issues that is being raised around leakages and uh, whether they're uh, as a result of uh, wear and tear or as a result of uh, theft or vandalism, that's a separate issue. But again, ensuring that even as we look at these investments, how do we ensure the hue and cry that has been around the cost of living? And this is one of the big areas I know the government is looking to address, is the cost of living. And petroleum products being a key driver of the economy, the decision that we take will have an impact of cost of living. So we do have that uh, real reality with us, so that as we make a decision, we really strike the right balance. We ensure we have a system that is available, that is robust, both from providing the revenue that is required, but ensuring that we monitor KPC to ensure that they're on the straight and narrow, but at the same time ensuring that those investments uh, are prudent and those investments do not affect the public when it comes to cost of living adversely. But really we have to have the reality that uh, some of the challenges that we're seeing today 
in terms of energy pricing and the cost of energy is not a Kenya-specific problem. It has been a global problem. The government has taken interventions, for instance, through the stabilization program, working with us at the regulator, to try and see how some of these areas can be addressed. There are other thinking and uh, postulations on how this best can be addressed. It depends on where you sit. I know the OMCs are challenged when it comes to cash flows as a result of some of these programs, but really it is not a Kenya-specific problem. problem. But um, as we have been looking at the trend of where the market is going, uh, we are seeing the market stabilizing. And hopefully, uh, you know, uh, fingers crossed, because really we don't want to see another sh uh, a, a shock, because really this is an international traded commodity. We don't, have the, the, we, we don't have the tools to be able to determine what the price is globally. But what is within our gift is how efficient can we be as a sector? How efficient can we be as industry? How can you assist us as a regulator to regulate the sector effectively and ensure that we then achieve a result which is the best for this country. So I, once again, I just want to thank all of you for making the time for being here uh, to be able to listen to the application by KPC. I think in closing, I just want to give an assurance. One of the questions that have been asked, uh, because we've been around the country when Kisumu, when Eldred, uh, the impact of uh, the application on the pump price. We're here today to listen to you. If there was a decision that had been taken, we would not have invited you, he you here today. So I just want to reiterate that we're here to take an application from KPC, allow KPC to make the application, tell stakeholders, the public, industry players, the fourth estate, civil society, what the application contains, allow us to hear your views, and then allow us as a regulator, as provided for in law, to retreat then after hearing all the views from all the stakeholders, including government, to be able then to go back and consider this application so that then when we make a decision, the decision is well informed, well thought out, and will be the benefit of this country. With those few remarks, I wish to thank you all. Thank you. is the uh, climax of our discussions today. Uh, we will be breaking now, uh, and I believe that we have lunch. So I want to hand over the meeting again to our communication um, so that they can lead us in a word of prayer and then direct us to where we are going to have our lunch. So, um, communication, please. Thank you very much. Uh, lunch will be served uh, on the fifth floor of this building, so we will proceed to, towards uh, the left, and then there are lifts. Those who can take the stairs, uh, they can also do so. But the lifts will be able to uh, be sufficient for everyone. Uh, at this point, I'll call upon Monica to pray for the food, and then we can dismiss. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Let us pray. Okay. Let us pray. Lord, unto your presence we are this afternoon. We want to thank you for you've been with us. We want to thank you for we have deliberated the issues surrounding the KPC tariff application, King of Glory. Thank you because of the unity. Thank you because of the cohesion. The results of this meeting, King of Glory, may they be of help to Kenyan. Now as we break, I do pray for everybody in this room. Be bless, bless their families and bless uh, each of them, King of Glory. As we go take the lunch, King of Glory, may it be blessed, King of Glory. And this we do play, breathing and trusting in the name of Jesus. <laughs>